it's an explicit trade-off between how much protection and how usable you want the authentication to be. So if we think of the two leading smartphone platforms at the moment, so Android and iOS, both of them, if you get the right device, now have some sort of biometric option available. So on Android, you've had the option for facial unlock, so unlocking by looking at the device and looking at the front-facing camera, and if it recognises you, it unlocks. That's been there since uh, 2011, late 2011. And late last year, Apple released the iPhone 5S with the so-called Touch ID, which is a fingerprint-based approach. Now, say, so having these, and the reason that these have become more prominent perhaps on mobile devices than uh, on traditional desktops, say, is that these devices aren't quite so well suited to the traditional authentication methods. Okay, you can use a pin on them, and that's vaguely tolerable if it's a short one. But if you wanted to use a, a complex password, so let's say eight or more characters with different character types, entering that on a smartphone screen is actually quite fiddly, particularly if that device is in and out of your pocket on a frequent basis. So having something that is more usable, quicker, more convenient for you, perhaps encourages the security to be used more often on the device. Okay, so that's it. Remembering that it's, it's frequent but short periods of use for a mobile device, as opposed to sitting down with a desktop or laptop system where you might be there for a while. So I say, face unlock, what that does, so you've got the legitimate user, hopefully, and they hold it up, it sees them, and it lets them have access. Okay, and it's, it's pretty quick, and it's very easy to use under the right conditions. It requires a little bit of effort, you've got to align your face to the camera and see yourself on the screen, but you, know, you can see it, and you can get it done within a couple of seconds. iOS is Touch ID, so what you've now got on the latest iPhone is this RF capacity sensor built into the home button. So this is leveraging an interaction that people would normally make on the phone anyway, so it's actually quite transparent in use, because you're used to, or as an iPhone user, used to pressing the home button to activate the device and to switch it on, etc. And so you're not asking the user to do something more than they would normally do. But what the sensor then does is, okay, the capacitive part of it detects the electrical signal that a, a living finger or thumb produces, and that then is utilised to, to grant access. And what that also means is that a dead finger won't work. So if you cut somebody's finger off, that will not unlock the device because it will no longer produce the electrical signal, which is always useful to know. So in terms of Touch ID, what can it be used for? Well, it can be used to unlock the device, and you can also enable it, via well, the menu options, to be used to authorise purchases from the iTunes store. So there's a couple of options for protecting your device with it. And the user can register up to five fingers. So that could be five of their own fingers, or they might register a couple of their, their own, and perhaps fingers of other people that they legitimately want to share the device with, if they're so minded to do so. Okay, and then it's just a simple question of placing their, their finger on the device to unlock it or to make that purchase authorization. And when it's working, it works really smoothly, it works within less than a second to unlock the device. Now, in both of the cases, in terms of both facial unlock and touch ID, the advertised rationale for having it is not promoted first and foremost as being a higher level of protection. Of course it's security, but neither Apple nor Google are making a claim that this is a better level of security than you would get from passwords and pins. So Apple's promotional text for touch ID makes the point that you check your iPhone dozens and dozens of times a day, and entering a passcode each time you do that slows you down. Okay? And Android for the face unlock, the, the advertising copy for that one, framed around making each person's device even more personal to them, not notably giving a higher level of protection. Perhaps a level of protection that people would be more likely to enable, because one, what you do find with pins and passwords, when that's the only option that a smartphone offers, many people don't turn that on because it's too inconvenient. So perhaps this will encourage more people to enable security. But if we look at um, the Android interface and where it positions facial unlock in terms of the strength of protection, we can see here, um, so facial unlock is around there, and it's ranked as low security. Okay, whereas Password, one here is high security, and PIN is medium to high. 
So, okay, nobody ever said pins and passwords were perfect, but here they're actually being cast as a better level of security than the biometric technique, which instinctively you might have thought was meant to be a higher level of protection. Okay, so it's explicitly cited as less secure, less protection, but perhaps more usability. Um, so similarly here, in terms of the description, it's, and I've highlighted with the ring, it says face unlock is less secure than a pattern, pin, or password. So all of the other authentication mechanisms that the Android device offers are considered more secure, but not necessarily as usable. Okay? And if the facial unlock fails, or it needs, needs to use an alternative, it drops through, to you, you can choose whether it drops through to using pattern or pin unlock as the fallback. Okay? Why might you need to have a fallback? Well, one reason, as I say, is that uh, it's not always going to work the facial unlock, so if you're in a dark room, the camera won't see your face. You can still see the screen, it still lights up, but the camera won't pick you up, so you can't use that mechanism. So that's a usability aspect. Another element is there is a questionable degree of security in the way this particular face recognition has been implemented. So the early version of it, you could simply hold up a picture of the legitimate user and the phone would unlock. There was no liveness detection. Built in. And what I've got here is a screenshot from a video that we've got on iTunes U of my colleague Nathan Clark holding up his Android phone and holding up to it an iPhone with his photograph on it and the Android phone unlocked in response to seeing the picture on the iPhone. Okay, so no, no requirement for it to be the actual user stood there. Later versions have introduced so-called liveness detection by requiring you to look at the device and blink to prove that you're a live user. But again, there are ways around that. So people have demonstrated having a picture of the legitimate user, but with eye holes cut in it, so you can blink and it still detects lives. <coughs> or you can even go to the extent of having an animated graphic that, that covers the eyes over and creates the impression of blinking. Similarly with the, the fingerprint approach, the touch ID, if the fingerprint recognition fails to work and it doesn't capture a suitable sample, then after a while, it will revert to the PIN or the password interface, whatever, again, you've, you've enabled as your underlying passcode. You've got to have a passcode to be able to use the Touch ID process. So the, the master thing, as I say, on the next slide, the primacy of the passcode is maintained. You can't use the, the Touch ID without having the passcode sat underneath it. You also need to revert to the passcode if you want to change any of the authentication settings on the device. Also, if you do a full reset on your phone, then when, you, when it comes back to life, it demands the passcode, not your fingerprint. And if you've gone for more than 48 hours without activating the device, it wants the passcode then. And perhaps the interesting situation you could find yourself in then is, you get asked for a passcode that you're using now far less frequently, and so perhaps you don't remember it as well. Okay, so you could find yourself relying on the fingerprint, and then when the passcode is finally asked for, you don't remember what it was. And I say, the, uh, the fingerprint approach is not always usable either. So there are various situations where, okay, this very convenient, takes just a second to do it method, will no longer work. So, for example, moisture. Okay, if you've got sweaty hands, if you just washed or something like that, um, it won't work then. If it's been raining, and we get that a lot in Plymouth, you don't necessarily get it as much here, but if it rains and you're trying to use the device outside and the sensor gets wet, you cannot for love or money get it to, to accept you, and you've got to revert to you know, rain slash screen to do the passcode. If your fingers are dirty, which of course it could be just because you're unhygienic or because you're doing some sort of work that requires your hands to get dirty, that prevents it from working. If you're wearing gloves, if you're cold, then you can't do it with gloves on, obviously. And also if there's skin damage. So to illustrate the point here, I have a picture of my wife's thumb taken just after she failed to be able to use the registered thumbprint to unlock her iPhone. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can perhaps see it's quite a manky skin damage thumb on this particular occasion. And so the iPhone couldn't recognize it. Okay, it was registered, but because the skin is all cracked and damaged there, it wouldn't actually work. So again, Various scenarios under which a perfectly usable technique in some situations then stops working and you have to fall back to something else.